Hi, I'm Richard and this is my 1972 Chrysler Valiant Charger 770. So um, a bit about how I got into cars. So when I was young, me and my dad would go to Speedway and we used to go to Rally New Zealand and stuff like that. So, but I was never sort of super into cars. I liked watching motorsport, really big motorsport fan. Um, so when I bought my first car, it was a 1980 Chrysler Avenger. So I was looking at getting a Kingswood um, wagon, but then I looked a couple, didn't really like it. But then um, I was around at my fiberglass guy's place because I'd, uh, you know, with a race car, you sort of buff up the uh, <laughs> fiberglass a bit, so I'd, I'd smashed up the fiberglass front spoiler. So it's around at his place. And he said, oh, do you know anyone who would be interested in a Charger? And I'd always loved the Charger because if you don't know, the Charger's got really great uh, race history in New Zealand. It practically won the Benson Hedges for, I think it was like eight years in a row. Like from all the way from 72 to like 80, they were unstoppable on New Zealand tracks. This particular model, so it was a production series, so they had the Benson Hedges 500 laded into the 1000, which was basically the equivalent of Bathurst, but for New Zealand. So it was our production race car series. So it was exactly this trim, so it was 770, which is the luxury model, um, 265 Hemi, which is the inline straight um, 4.3 litre and uh, auto, auto gearbox and LSD. So exactly this trim here. Um, I've actually spoken to Racing Ray Williams who used to race him back in the 70s and he was, he, 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 he raves about him because um, yeah, they were brilliant race cars. So yeah, he said, um, do you know anyone wants to buy one? And it had been, at that stage it been storage for a couple of years. So I said, yep, me. <laughs> so he dug it out of storage, took it for a drive. It was so covered in dust, had no idea how good it was. Um, so I bought it on the spot. It was uh, 10 grand back then. <laughs> Loved it straight away. Um, took it home, cleaned it. And I'm like, wow, actually this is really nice because they had like a thick layer of dust on. So like, you know, the interior looked quite shabby, but polished up and it's like, sweet ass. So that was back in 2004. So 17 years ago, I have my other cars, so I'll sort of alternated, but this one always sort of sits in the garage. It's my sort of my long time sort of forever car, especially with the value of them now. I mean, they've gone up in price so much that if I ever sold it, I'd, I'd basically never be able to afford another Charger again. So it's sort of really cool to still be able to have it, and especially because it's such an iconic car. Yeah. And yeah, it's got a really cool history sort of thing. So yeah, there's import rules where you had to have, uh, I think it was like something like 60 odd percent of the car had to be um, New Zealand manufactured. So like all the trims New Zealand made, all the exhaust, all, the, all that sort of components are New Zealand made. And the rest of the car is all, um, yeah, bought up as a kit sort of thing. So it came in the second shipment over. So they hadn't quite tooled up for the uh, charger yet, so it's got a lot of quirky bits on it, like it's got the doors of the hard top, because normally they have like a quarter light window in the front and the back windows are, are very different. They're all sort of custom made out of like <laughs> kitchen components and stuff like that, so it's, it's really cobbled, it's a bit cobbled to give them that respect, but it's really quirky because it's unlike any other charge you'll see because you know it's sort of almost like a pre-production run and like it had the ranger steering wheel on it i've actually changed over to the charger steering wheel because i used to get so much people going oh why's it got a ranger steering wheel on <laughs> and it's like because that's how it came it's like they didn't have all the parts read so it's, it's really quirky in that respect it's got a few things other things like it's got the australian dress up package so it's got domed glass on the um, on the gauges and stuff like that, which the normal production run didn't have, because in New Zealand, same with the Avengers, we only had one trim level. So every single charge that was New Zealand assembled was this exact configuration with um, the 265 Hemi Auto and LSD. If you wanted um, like any, anything like the V8 or any options, they were, they were Aussie assembled and imported over and sold new. So it's a 265 Hemi, which it's Australian designed in line six. So the, I don't know how true this is, but the, the, the origin of it supposedly is from a US uh, truck engine that had a single cylinder design and um, Chrysler and the States were gonna use it for a, for a pickup truck sort of engine, but they never did anything with it. So it was fully designed in Australia. Um, it was a replacement to the Slant 6, the 225 Slapper. Um, so it's, you know, traditional sort of push rod, um, underhead cam, uh, 4.3 litre, so 265 Hemi. It's not actually a true Hemi, because Hemis have a hemispherical head, 
So that's sort of, a bit like the Pentarus that you'd have in a modern Japanese engine, but it was a hemispherical head. Where this one is slightly domed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's semi hemi is what I always call it. Yeah, it's weird if we go to car shows and uh, and actual Americans come over because they've, they're so used to the Dodge Charger, which the Dodge Charger is massive compared to this thing. This thing's actually really short um, because of this. They it's a short wheelbase version of a normal Valiant. So a normal Valiant they've got six inches longer wheelbase, so I took it out in between the front and back wheels, basically with the back seaters to make a short wheelbase coupe. And the boot's like a good six inches long, uh, shorter as well. So this is probably a good foot shorter than a normal Valiant. And then you have hard tops, which are about another foot and a bit longer. And they also had the, what they call the, the limo as well, which is, a, is the same size as the hard top as well. So there's sort of three different sizes you got it, and this is the sort of the smallest sort of, they called this a sports coupe back in the day. Um, it's weird to think this is a sports coupe when you're talking about like modern Japanese cars, even European sports coupes, you think of something a lot smaller, a lot more nimble, but in the 70s, you know, this was, you know, what you'd sort of, down here is what you'd class as sports coupes. After, so it was built when the first production runs, and it was actually a dealer car for the um, Danny Vick uh, Chrysler dealership, Todd Motors dealership. So it went there from, from new, um, and it sat there for around about three months or so. And then uh, I've actually spoken to the, the original, original owner, and he bought it after a couple of beers down with the, uh, the local owner of the uh, Chrysler Valley dealership. So he was mates with him, and he was down there, and you know, having, having some beers after work. And and the uh, and the owner was like, "Oh, do you, do you do you want to buy the, the the Charger?" So he's like, "Oh yeah, sweet." He's actually a city councillor for Napier or something when I rang him, um, and he remembered it well. He only had it for about three months before he went over to. Aussie, uh, oh, we went to America, sorry, um, and sold it back to dealers. So then for the next four years, it was a dealer car. So it um, went around from dealer to dealer, had 14 dealerships owned it. And on ownership papers, it's like either zero kilometers or you know, like 100 miles basically driving from dealership to dealership. So it's sort of been the first, first four years of its life just being a, a showroom car. <laughs> Yeah, demo car, which is quite it was good because it was, it's really well specced for a New Zealand Charger. So as a demo car, it was, it was a really great model to show off. Um, then one old guy bought it in 1976, so that's age was four years old. He owned it till 2001, so he owned it a long time. Um, he, from what I can tell, he put it into storage in about 84. Kept it in storage until late 90s. Um, you can see if you look up on Car Jam, you can see there's no activity up until about around about 98 or 99. Then he started using it. Um, was he the enthusiastic polisher? Yes, he was the enthusiastic polisher. So it's the only thing you know, see on this car. It's got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, little uh, surface rust where he's uh, just polished a bit too hard. It's it's never grown like 17 years I've had, so it's just that nice little patina, and I love it because it, it shows that it's uh, sort of classic original. Yeah, so he owned it till 2001, and then after that, uh, little short girl, who uh, was the daughter of my, the guy who does my fabulousing, she bought it, and she was like a tiny little thing. She used it for about a year, um, then put it into. Um, storage in about 2002 so um, I bought it in 2004 so it has spent most of its life in storage so from 84 to about 98 and then from 2000 to 2004 I bought it at 76,000 miles which for a car that was this age was pretty low I've, done, I've driven up to about just around about 105,000 miles now um, yeah pretty decent yeah so it's it's turning 50 next year so February next year it turns 50. Is that a 50th gift for it? <laughs> I don't know, I might take it out for a drive or something. <laughs> I love like the period pieces, like how the how it's been done in this period. Like the wheels, these wheels here, they're um, Wormag wheels, which is a New Zealand wheel manufacturer. Uh, they're based down in Onihanga. Um, they closed down around about 1980. So they're only made in the 70s, but you know, it's a very rare, New Zealand built wheel for it, so and it just looks completely period. Um, and the stripe down the side, it was put on aftermarket. I'm pretty sure it was done by the guy who owned it from '76. And I'm pretty sure there's a movie um, called uh, 
Crazy Harry Dirty Mary or something like that. Um, and it features a Dodge Charger, exactly the same color as mine with that diminishing V stripe down the side. So you look at the poster for that movie and it's, it's like identical sort of thing. So I like to think that, because that movie came out in 76 as well when he bought this car. So yeah, so my head canon in, in my mind is that the old guy bought it because he just saw this movie and he's like, oh, I love the Charger with the black stripe down it and the mags on it. So, you know, that's why I think he, he, he watched that movie, went out and bought it, got the stripes put on it and put the mags on it. If you know my other cars, you know, I do pretty crazy stuff for my Avengers sort of stuff. And when I bought them, they were very much um, already um, bustardized. They were already mongrels, so that I had nothing to start with. Like I was watching a, a sort of trade me article, uh, trade me auction recently for another Avenger. And someone was saying, oh, you ruined a per perfectly good classic, how could you? And it's like, A, you don't know how long, you know, he said he had it for 15 years or something, right? So obviously he's done a good job. Yeah, he's got, had it just had a chin spot on it. So obviously he's had it for 15 years, 12 years or whatever he had it for. So he has had it for a long time. So he's kept the classic on the road for that long. And you have no idea what condition he bought it in. He, he could, all those modifications could have been done before he bought it. And even if he, even if he did, do the customization himself, it's his car, he can do whatever he wants with it sort of thing. So, you know, but this car here, because when I bought it, it was so original. Basically nothing had ever been done on it except for the wheels and the stripe. Then, you know, I've decided just to sort of leave it as it is and, you know, always keep a garage. So, you know, it's just gonna basically stay as a time capsule, as you said. This is so well known because in the 70s, it was so iconic because it was, it won, it just basically dominated New Zealand racing for like the entire of the 70s. So it was just, like, it was a Kiwi um, Australian phenomenon, right? They had the whole Hey Charger campaign and you know, they were really awesome, just little ki Kiwi New Zealand built, you know, race car sort of thing. So I don't, and I could think most people would see the American ones as being a big yank tank and, and wouldn't be too interested in them. But here, it's like the local hero sort of thing. It's the, like I'd have no interest in buying a, a big American a Charger because it has no connection to me. You know, I, I, I know these from the racing history. I know watching them hooting around uh, Bathurst and, and Pugkoe and stuff. And that, that's my memories of them, which is specific to the, the Berlin Charger rather than the Dodge Charger. So and I think that's, especially now as they're getting older, people getting that nostalgia and they're, they're remembering back and remembering fondly and so that's what's driving the price up yeah. and you know it, it's, that's probably why it's more than a normal valiant as well because they didn't use the normal valiants for racing and they weren't just you know so sort of that sort of iconic sort of stature sort of thing so yeah it's when everyone sees this it's like you know it's funny when I, whenever anyone sees my Avengers they always say, oh, that was my first car. I used to have one of these when I was a kid. You know, used to, the amount of people who told me that the crashed Avengers rolled Avengers. <laughs> it's the first car that completely ran into the ground and stuff. But, you know, Chargers were, whenever anyone comes up, it was always, oh, my dad had a, had a, had a Charger or oh, I really wanted a Charger when I was a kid. So it was more sort of that, not a lot of people owned them. They held it sort of on a pedestal sort of thing. So yeah, totally different response to the, to the cars. But yeah, and I think that's why the value is what it is. You know, I, myself, I don't think it's worth that much. You know, it's like, again, it comes back to just, I've owned it for so long and it's just my value sort of thing. I think one day the bubble's gonna burst, especially for these ones. Yeah, I don't, it's probably way off yet. And also as people get older, they're more well off sort of thing. So they've got more, more money to blow on a car. When we were teenagers, you know, we didn't have sort of, yeah, 50, 60 grand to, to, to blow on a car, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, and I think for a car like this, it had to be like this for like the old guy owned it from 76 to 2001 and I owned it basically since then. So to have something in this sort of condition, it needs to have sort of very few owners and, and miss that sort of period where you got the high value when it's new and then it drops down to like basically nothing and then it starts climbing in price. But when it's down in that trough, that's what you've got to avoid. You've got to have a good owner for that period of time because otherwise some kid's going to buy it as their first car or someone's going to modify it and, and, and do all sorts of crazy stuff to it. And that's sort of when you sort of goes off the rails. So, and that's why the price also goes up too, because so few cars survive that period where they're worth nothing. You know, there was a, probably a time you couldn't give these away. You know, I reckon early early 90s or something, you know, you could probably pick one of these up for a couple of grand sort of thing, you know, and just, you know, no one sort of wanted them. 
they weren't classics yet and they were sort of in that slump period where, you know, um, and I think that's like with the Avengers too, that in any, any classic car that's sort of where you lose most of them, you know, particularly Skylines. I mean, you look at Skylines now, they're worth bucket loads. And all my mates back when I was young had, had Skylines and they just bought them for like nothing. You know, you look at how people who bought them for a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks, how they treated them. Yeah, yeah. You know, none of my friends who had Skylines and they bought them for that sort of price, you know, sort of sub, sub thousand dollars sort of thing. None of them treated them well. They would they'd rip the crap out of them, thrash the shit out of them and then they'd just, you know, they'd, they never survive. And that's why you see them going for the price they are now because they didn't survive that, that sort of bottom of the trough period. So that's why I'm glad, yeah, this one here, it hasn't had, it's, you know, the old guys that sort of owned it through the 90s, which would probably would have been the, the slump period for these. And then I put, sort of picked it up just on the sort of tail of going up sort of thing, you know, sort of thing. So caught it before they went, they skyrocketed. So same if you bought a Skyline back in that sort of certain period, you could have picked one up for a grand and then now it'd be worth like moonbeams, you know, so <laughs> yeah. You probably see a better, better return on investment than even what I have on this. <laughs> so if you pick bought at the right time. It's, but it's always really hard to pick what the future class is going to be, you know. There's, there's show-ins, like, you know, you know, like, your NSX is always going to be an iconic car. Because of just what it is. The Charger also, easy bet. You know, that's why I've never been worried about how much this thing is worth, because it's my Valiant. So, you know, I'm, I've always owned it, I'm always going to own it sort of thing. So that's just sort of a, a paper value sort of thing, you know. So you don't even worry about um, like getting precious because of the value? No, no. Nah. Nah. I mean, I, yeah, I bought it to use it and it's, you know, it's, I'm not going to treat it any differently just because I, you know, same with my other cars, you know, I spent heaps of money doing them up, but I've used them up to, to to use them, like you know, in both, both my cars, I'll, I'll race them on the track on the track days, you know, I'll take them all those South Island, you know, I don't never trade any of my cars. This is actually my tow beast, so yeah. <laughs> I've got quite cool photos of uh, this towing both my Avengers. So when I when I when I went up and picked up my Avenger wagon, I picked it up in this <laughs> so, trailer on the back of it, you know. <laughs> like I had one mate who um, used to always hassle me at one of my old jobs, and he had a R34 GTR. And he's always used to call it a big uh, yank tank. And A, it's, it's not American. <laughs> and B, if you look up the specs of it, it's within a couple of, it, within an inch or two of the um, skyline in every single, um, every single aspect. The wheel, the wheel base is almost exactly the same. The length is exactly the same. The width is exactly the same. But, you know, I think just because old cars, you know, they, they turn up at the edge sort of thing. So they're very bulky where, you know, modern cars sort of round off. So sort of, it looks bigger than it is, and when you're on the road, it doesn't, it doesn't feel big to me. Yeah, you know, it's, you know, so it's not like it's an American one, or just like a bazillion years long. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> For coming along, and it was quite cool for context. We, we well, Richard drove the car in, and then <laughs> jacked it up on dollies. We had to like push it around to get it to fit in the garage because we just weren't sure, weren't sure if it was going to. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's right up against the wall. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's, there's, there's no reverse. It's, it's pushed hard up against the wall. Yeah, so just knock back. Just knock back through the wall. Yeah, it's got no power. Just bump straight through the back. <laughs> yeah, she'll be fine. Bump out. <laughs>